corner there. Good to see you. Maybe, I hope so. Uh, this is not about my hockey career, which was stellar, of course. Uh, one of the most repeated quotes of the 20th century uh, had to be Wayne Gretzky's quote uh, about his strategy on the ice. And you can see that. I skate to where the puck is going, not where it's been. And the likes of Steve Jobs and Warren Buffett and countless others have used and paraphrased Gretzky's quote to make important uh, parallels and draw parallels to business. Uh, having a plan, looking ahead, anticipating changing environments and being nimble. So I will shamelessly borrow from the great one to say that our next panel is about where that metaphorical puck is going in our business. And as we'll hear from our panelists, that puck is moving away from people who look like me as more and more women enter the workforce as graduates of our colleges and universities and, more, uh, and as minority-led households dominate new household composition as much as 85% of the growth in front of us. So moderating our panel today, I'm delighted to say, is Bill Ferguson, who is chairman and CEO of both for, uh, Ferguson Partners Limited and co-chairman and co-CEO of FPL Advisory Group. And without further ado, William, over to you. Thank you, Doug. Uh, coming from Chicago and being a Blackhawks fan, I do sincerely appreciate that hockey analogy, so thank you for that. Uh, good morning, everybody, and thank you for joining us. Um, while we're going to have fun on this panel, this is an incredibly serious discussion. So, uh, and we'll explain more as we, uh, uh, as we go on. Uh, I'm going to take a minute and establish the context, and then I'm going to turn it over to the uh, four luminaries to my left uh, to uh, discuss some real-time um, real examples. So anyway, when you look at the popular media, uh, m most of the studies have proven the case uh, that there's a correlation between uh, diversity and financial performance. So this is a, an issue that is not uh, some social issue that all of us are kind of tugging at the tails of the coats. Uh, but there's actually some significant research that has proven that a diversity of perspectives actually lead to uh, a business being run more effectively. And it, it is all about an openness and a willingness to accommodate different perspectives uh, before one makes a decision uh, in running you know, any part of the business. And in order to have that openness and the perspective, you need a variety of people around the table. Okay, you need people of different genders, uh, different cultural backgrounds, whatever, because that is truly going to enrich uh, the conversation and I think uh, ultimately make a better, uh, a better informed decision, for sure. As you can see from the slide, um, corporate America is better today than it once was, but still when you look at, for example, the women uh, on the boards of public companies, uh, you look at the women in the C-suites, uh, we still have a ways to go, uh, if you look at the, uh, the state of play uh, facts there in particular. And unfortunately, the real estate industry, maybe save the multifamily business, um, Doug, I did that plug for you there, um, is in worse shape, uh, to be frank. So there's a lot, uh, a lot of room for improvement. We do a diversity survey every year, a 2016 diversity survey, this industry still doesn't link diversity with accountability. Okay, so you can talk about diversity all you want and inclusion, but if you don't hold people accountable for doing specific things to enrich the culture and promote diverse talent, you're not gonna get there. So we as an industry clearly uh, have a ways to go. Um, if you look at this particular slide, uh, we're not much better at the boards either. Uh, you know, we cover about 300 public companies, and if you look at the women in particular on the boards of the public companies, the REITs, the home builders, whatever, uh, we still have a ways to go, uh, for sure. And a lot of our actual mandates are diversity oriented uh, for, uh, for good reason. So I just wanted to give everybody a little bit of the context of what diversity means and a little bit of the state of play, both as it relates to uh, corporate America and uh, our industry. And with that, I'd like if, uh, Lori, if you could start, 
Uh, each of the panelists introduce themselves, their companies. I think most of you know them, but it's better if they do it than I do it. Hi, um, hi uh, everyone. I'm Laurie Baker, and I am the Senior Vice President at Camden Property Trust uh, for our fund and asset management group. I also um, and we'll be talking in the context, I'm the immediate past president, the national president for Commercial Real Estate Women Crew. And so I'll be sharing a little bit about Camden's culture and what we've done, as well as some of the, uh, the findings in my, in my role as the crew national president that I've been able to be involved with. Great, good morning everyone. I'm Julie Smith. I'm the Chief Administrative Officer for the Bazudo Group. Uh, we're located in the Washington, D.C. area. Um, and uh, in my role, I'm responsible for all um, human resource functions, marketing, technology, strategy, et cetera. Um, I also serve as the chair of the um, NMHC Diversity and Inclusion Committee, and I'm chair of uh, the Women's Leadership Initiative for ULI Washington. So spend a tremendous amount of time studying the issue of diversity and inclusion in my own organization and uh, in the industry in general. So very pleased to have this discussion today. Uh, good morning. I'm Ken Bacon, I'm managing partner of Railfield Realty Partners, uh, which is an investment firm based in Bethesda, Maryland. I also serve as vice chair of the Real Estate Executive Council, which is an organization of black and Latino uh, executives in the real estate industry. And before that, I used to be important. I used to work at Fannie Mae. Uh, so I used to lend a lot of y'all a lot of money, which thank you, you've all repaid. And, uh, uh, and I also serve on the boards of several companies, including two, uh, REITs, Well Tower, and Forest City Realty Trust. So when I talk today, I'll give you perspective both from uh, my current business, Fannie Mae, and, and a board perspective. Uh, good morning. My name is Mitch Harrison. I'm the CEO of First Communities. We're a third party uh, management firm in Atlanta, Georgia manage 38,000 units across the southeast, have been in business for 40 years, um, also past president of the Atlanta Apartment Association, and current chair of the Georgia Apartment Industry Education Foundation, it's a mouthful, um, and I'm going to be sharing some things that we're doing there at the foundation in the state of Georgia to help promote uh, diversity and inclusion and really attract uh, young people to our industry, so look forward to it. And uh, Mitch, any insights for the uh, audience relative to who's going to win the Super Bowl? I'm going to say Atlanta. All right? I'm going to say Atlanta. <laughs> <laughs> I really didn't doubt the answer there for sure, but let's, let's, let's root for the, uh, for the upstarts for sure. So anyway, Julie, if we can turn to you to start, um, I guess the most obvious question for a lot of people in the audience is why should organizations even worry about diversity and inclusion? And as a second question, should the multifamily industry worry about it more? Well, I think that um, any company that wants to be successful today should worry about diversity and inclusion because um, at the end of the day, it's all about talent. Um, our business uh, is, um, is, is run by talent. We can't do anything um, and, and any parts of our industry without having the very best people. And, you know, I think it's a, it's a really interesting issue um, because in the next few years, we will, for the first time ever, have four generations uh, working in, this, in, in our companies. So it's um, very likely that you could be standing in the kitchen or I could be standing in my kitchen at Bazudo and have um, someone who is Gen Z, someone who is Gen X, someone who is Gen Y, and a boomer. And we all um, have very different priorities in lives, and we all see the world a different way, yet we're all women. And so really having a sort of cultural awareness and cultural um, competency within our organizations, I, I think is really important to having, you know, engaged, motivated teams who are all trying to accomplish, you know, the same strategic initiatives for the company. So I think it's hugely important, and it's all about people. Um, Lori, let's, let's turn to you for a minute. Let's talk a little bit about the multifamily business in particular. And if you look at the multifamily business, um, you know, what's the, what's the state of play? What, what would you say is, how, where have we come from, where are we going, how well are we doing? 
Yeah, women have continued to I, make great strides and gain ground within the commercial real estate industry. I think the audience here is a reflection of that. I can remember coming to the NMHC meetings 20 years ago, and there were very few women in the room. I think that uh, you, you know there's been a strong initiative within organizations within the National Multi Housing Council, groups like. Crew, which is um, commercial real estate women, to, to bring awareness and, and look for talent and get people attracted to this business. I think the more difficult uh, thing for all of us in our organizations, as Julie mentioned, is attracting talent. And, and talent needs to be um, diversity and gender as well as diversity and in intellectual you know, thinking and, and various ages. So within Crew, we recently did a, uh, a five, five-year benchmark study, it was our third benchmark study, where it was a very comprehensive study utilizing MIT, who did all of the work, and, and what we found is that there still is a, a very large gap in wages for women versus men in the commercial real estate business. And so if you take a look at kind of the, the overall total compensation, the, the medium, is you can see on this slide that women earning, are earning about 115,000 versus men at 150,000. So you've got about a 23.3% gap in their, in their wages. And it varies based on disciplines within the industry with the, the largest differences being within the brokers and followed by developers. We also saw in that study that um, within the C-suite, uh, yes, there's a lot more people that are women that are getting closer to the C-suite, but there's a huge gap there. Um, more and more women are in senior VP roles, they're in director roles, as well as partners in firms. But the the uh, getting to the C-suite has is, is been something, as you showed on the slide earlier, as well as board seats, has been very difficult. And then the wages, once they arrive at those those levels is there as much as 30% difference in wages. So there's there's work to still be done, but creating the awareness and having panels like this, um, it does a lot to kind of move the needle, so to speak. Right. And Julie, let me go back to you for a minute. Yeah. Let's talk a little bit about the multifamily business. When we're uh, you know doing board mandates for multifamily firms, um, you know I, I think a lot of investors and clients, you know, given the heterogeneity of the workforce, the women making a lot of the kind of consumer decisions. Um, I, I think there's a more compelling argument uh, for diversity in the sector from the top on down. Do you have any yeah, view or perspective on that? You will see a, a melting pot of people <clears throat> of every, um, every age, every ethnicity, um, every um, gender, you'll see, uh, you know, we're, we're now even <clears throat> dealing with issues of transgender and how we're dealing with uh, development, um, you know, sort of development decisions related to that. So, so I, I think it's really important for us to be good service providers at the end of the day, for us to build apartment communities that are, um, that are full, that get the highest rent, and that have the highest retention, that we really understand who we're serving. So it's really important that our companies um, reflect the communities that we're serving. And um, you know, we, we see that sort of coming in to the industry. And I think that most of us, if we looked at the um, sort of the, the mix at, um, at sort of the community level, it, we're pretty comfortable with that. But it really diverges once you start getting into higher levels of management. So I, I, I think that um, as the world is changing so ever so quickly that we, um, we just need to really be on top of our game, and the way we're going to be able to do that is by having a very diverse um, uh, um, population within our companies, um, but more importantly, one that's inclusive, so that people feel like their opinions matter, that their perspective matters, that um, that that we are all listening to each other, and um, and just be, becoming stronger as a, re a result of it. But I think you're absolutely right in terms of um, of, of women and. Um, you know, I have two daughters, so we're, we're sort of uh, 
dominant in my family. Um, fortunately, I have two male dogs, so that helps out a little bit for my husband. But you know, we basically run the show at home, and um, <laughs> and and women and women run the show as it relates to housing decisions. Ninety-one percent of all housing decisions are made by women. Ninety-four percent of all home furnishing decisions are made by women. Women control will control in the next five years six trillion dollars. Of, uh, of wealth and will control two-thirds of all spending. And so women are making a lot of buying decisions and they're making decisions as to who's renting our apartments. So we think that that's something that we have to be, you know, that's, it's, it's in our best interest and our companies be paying attention to that. Lori, let me ask you a question on the crew research. Did you look at uh, different sectors relative to multifamily versus the other commercial? real estate sectors relative no, they, to? They did not end up breaking out, um, you know, office, multifamily, industrial. They're, they're more of the research was related to the disciplines within those areas. Okay. Um, the, the good news is once they do a five-year study, then they kind of spend the next five years each year breaking down some of the data and doing white papers. And this year, they'll be focused on really some of the information in the study about, uh, you know, just the the unbiased, um, you know, kind of thinking that people don't even necessarily realize um, that, that, that there are biases in their workplace, and it is about inclusiveness and, um, and really bringing awareness to some of our hiring decisions and making sure that when we cast the net for candidates and we only end up getting, you know, four males that we're, we, we push back and say, no, th there's got to be much more diverse candidates. You know, let's go back and see if we can get you know, uh, ethnicity into this, this picture and the equation as well as gender. But the, we're, that'll be one of the areas that they'll be addressing. And just the whole unconscious bias that uh, just kind of permeates throughout the industry and real estate in particular. And I don't think anybody purposely is, you know, sometimes making those decisions. It's just people's, their, their reflexes are to kind of go to what's worked in the past, it's comfortable, mm -hmm. instead of kind of stretching themselves to do something different and maybe changing up the mix of, of mindsets and thinking and, and age groups that they're, they're uh, you know, looking at to bring into the fold. Right, okay. Ken, it's time to bring the men into the conversation, <laughs> I think. But, you know, what, what's your experience relative to the organizations you've been with and what you've seen work better and maybe not so well? Uh, well, number one, I think it really starts from the top. When uh, Doug Bibby recruited me to Fannie Mae, uh, uh, I remember that uh, Frank Raines was at uh, Fannie Mae then, but that was uh, it as far as anybody black in senior management. Uh, and yet, by the time uh, I left, uh, you know, F Fannie Mae, in fact, is, is kind of maybe down a little bit from what it used to be. But I mean, the diversity had just been woven into the fabric. And what it really was about was just getting the best people. And as I've walked the halls here, uh, I'm very proud of a lot of the people who had, had worked for me. Uh, clearly, uh, when I looked at Capital One, uh, uh, Grace Hoopsher, uh, as Grace steps down, Jeff Lee is there, uh, Miguel Gutierrez at Cap Reed, uh, Vince Toy at Wells Fargo. Uh, these are all people uh, that came to Fannie Mae. I wish I could say that I trained them, educated them, we didn't, but I think we gave all these people an opportunity to really shine. And uh, I think that's important because at the end of the day, uh, I think that uh, we all have biases, right? I mean, I don't care you're black, white, green, yellow, everybody has a bias. And at the end of the day, what it's really about is overcoming your own biases and finding talent. And uh, uh, I used to like to think that I was like, great, I didn't have any biases. And I remember <laughs> that there were a couple of uh, women at Fannie Mae that I underestimated. And what I learned, uh, and I le saw this in my daughter, a lot of times I think, you know, if you're a guy and you come in and you pound the table, people say you're assertive, you're aggressive, we value that. It's hard for a woman to do that, uh, because if a woman does that, we're ready to put a different label on it, which I, I'm not going to use that word here. We know but, what you mean. We know uh, what you mean. And, yeah. and so, you know, a lot of times, I mean, look, I, I, the perfect example is like my daughter, you know, used to watch the Kardashians. My daughter seemed like a normal, you know, just girly girl. And then one day I started reading some of her essays. And I realized that, not that I ever thought my daughter was dumb, but I realized I had underestimated her ambition. I had underestimated her intelligence. 
Uh, and I found that when I looked at Fannie Mae, I said, you know, there were some people there. And I even apologized to one woman one time, and I said, you know, I should have promoted you sooner, mm -hmm. right? And I didn't realize how talented you were. So uh, I think that even a place like Fannie Mae, and it's even as good as I like to think I am, that you know, it's something that you have to work at. And what makes me work at it is partly wanting to have the best talent. And that's what I see in the boardroom of um, companies like at, at Forest City. A lot of you are familiar with uh, Mary Ann Gilmartin in New York, uh, Debbie Ratner Salzburg in Washington. So it's, it's, it's been very evident in terms of the talent uh, that that's what you have to do. But, uh, you know, you want the best talent, you have to do it. But there's another thing I don't think we talk about enough, and that it's just the right thing to do. Uh, having a daughter, uh, when she talked about working, my daughter's at Morgan Stanley, one of the things I told her, well, don't go to any place if you don't see some women who succeeded there. Uh, when she had someone who yelled at her one time, she didn't know how to deal with that. And uh, I said, this is how you deal with it. Uh, so I've, uh, having a daughter, uh, clearly being black, uh, these are issues I've had to deal with all my life, but one of the things that, that I've learned, you know, it's just the right thing to do, and it's the, it's the golden rule, do unto others as you would have them do unto you, and so I always feel it's important that, you know, you give everybody a chance, and in the day, that's what it's all about. Yep. yep. Good counsel, and it always seems to start at home, doesn't it? Yeah. So, mm -hmm. Mitch, let's turn to you. Uh, Ken talked a little bit about this concept of leadership commitment. Sure. And if you don't have leadership commitment, you know, as, as Ken said, starting at the board level, the C-suite, whatever, uh, hard to effectuate the kind of change that's necessary. Um, right. Talk a little bit about that, if you would. From a leadership standpoint, and, and to talk a little bit about what Ken was saying in terms of bias, um, you know, acknowledgement of that, I think, is a very key point. And, um, you know, your approach to how you manage the situation. I, I was reading a, uh, a Harvard Business Review article about diversity, and uh, it, it essentially basically talks about how there's diver the diversity training that a lot of companies are engaging in essentially is the same diversity training that was adopted in the 60s. Um, and, and while that might be effective through the 60s and 70s to an extent, we're in a different day and age demographically, as, as you'll see on some of these slides. Um, the world's changing very fast. Um, so from a leadership perspective, it's imperative that you stay engaged uh, with your people and your teams um, without that, and having the conversations about bias. Um, those are the things, from my perspective, that I lean on uh, my people to, to give me perspective on what's happening uh, uh, out in the workforce and, and how we're doing from a diversity inclusion state, uh, standpoint. So uh, certainly engagement uh, from a leadership standpoint, it's not just checking a box. Um, it's, it's rolling up your sleeves because it is a sensitive issue. Um, you know, we're making business decisions every day um, that can be clearly defined. Um, and, 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 and hopefully they're driven um, through some social accountability too, and that's the other part too. Encouraging social accountability for uh, your people um, is very important. And, and again, it's, it's not an easy thing, um, but those conversations have to be had um, in, in, in an age where uh, uh, change is, is taking place from a, from a demographic standpoint. Yeah, I mean, you know, clearly from our perspective, uh, we talked a little bit about board recruitment. Um, you know, kind of getting the first uh, person of color, woman on the board, makes a huge difference. Because when the company's then looking for a second director, that person often says, well, have you really looked at a diverse universe? Um, you know, if I had a dollar for every time a client said, you know, I'd love a diverse candidate, but uh, I can't find them. Well, you can find them, but you gotta work hard to find them. Or, you know, when the company's looking for a CFO, you know, hopefully uh, the board member says, hey, have we looked at a diverse universe? And if not, let's go look. So you've got to have that leadership commitment. It's got to start at the board level, and then it's got to percolate right down to the senior management team. Otherwise, I think it's really, really, really difficult to make it happen, for sure. So, um, Lori, do you want to talk a little bit about um, some of the successes that uh, you've had at Camden? I mean, not you personally. Yeah. And Rick is probably going to take some of the credit for that. But anyway, talk about Camden a little bit. Well, I, you know, I think, as we all talked about, it does start at the top. 
Um, you, you know, it's, it's having a leadership that is committed and embraces the fact that, uh, you know, you want a diverse work environment, you want to uh, have a board that supports that, that vision. And, you know, I think a couple years ago there was, a, we were, you know, Camden was approached and was asking about how we uh, looked at the diversity piece. And, and it was, you know, it gave us pause because we stepped back and said, this is just who we've always been. It's when I started the company 18 years ago, what attracted me to the company was the fact that the leadership team then had women um, in those leadership roles and they promoted based on merit and achievements and talent and, and nothing else. So I've never felt like there was anything different about the organization other than, you know, that's just how th their value system was. Um, you know, in, in recently, we've continued to get, um, you know, awards and accolades about that. Uh, this was in 2016, the ninth year in a row that Camden was one of the top uh, places to work. We were ranked number nine on Fortune's best places to work. Um, we just recently in December were ranked number 13 for diversity. And um, we continue to have recognition on being the best place for Gen Xers, for Latinos, and, um, and women. So, you know, we don't go at it looking to get on some list. What's nice is that the, you know, the public has recognized that we're doing a pretty good job of that. Um, and then more recently, we've, we um, have taken the approach at the board level. So I saw the slide earlier that showed with the REITs. Camden's a public REIT. We had, um, you know, I think it showed maybe 12 and a half percent were women. Um, several years ago, we made a commitment that we were going to get an African American on our board as well as um, a Latino woman. And then as of this month, we've just uh, appointed two more women to our board. So we will be at 30% of our 10 trust managers will be women and 40% uh, with diversity given our, our lead um, on the, on the trust, uh, amongst the trust managers is the African American. So I, I will tell you as a woman in our organization who's worked at the uh, Camden for 18 years, it makes me proud to know that you know, we're putting our money where our mouth is. It's starting at our leadership level uh, beyond just Rick and Keith who formed an incredible company where women um, are attracted to the organization, Latinos and Hispanics and, and Asians, um, because they know we're a, a company that's going to support the diversity and thinking and building cross-functional teams that are multicultural. So when you joined Camden, you said there were already a fair amount of women in the senior leadership. Where did, where did that come from? Was that Rick and Keith kind of pushing that, pushing that concept? Was that, were they the ones that really, I assume, yeah. got and, that? Uh, and, it, and it was. I mean, you know, Rick um, and Keith will, will share with, uh, you know, with anyone that they visit with that their original, their first job before they started Camden, they had like two jobs um, in their whole career, but was in an environment that was not very inclusive did not promote diversity, um, was kind of a piratesmanship um, organization, and they said that's, that's exactly what they didn't want, and they set out creating um, values that we, everybody in the company knows what these values are, um, and it, it's something you have to sign up for, or you probably need to go somewhere else. And, um, and so because you know, we lead by example, their example is what's allowed all of our, you know, our colleagues to feel comfortable with sharing their thoughts and being, you know, I think it's even the, the inclusivity is what's so important that people are not afraid to, to speak their minds and it doesn't matter what you look like or, you know, what your gender is, you're going to be heard and respected and, and rewarded for bringing value to the organization. It's simple as that. Right. And Julie, you know, Bazzuto is not a public company and hence don't have quite the same scrutiny probably from investors and so forth that the REITs do anyway. But, you know, Bazzuto is also another great example of embracing diversity and, and uh, in its leadership ranks and whatever. Uh, share with the audience a little bit of how that's come to be and lessons learned. Well, we've, um, you know, we, again, this is a, this is a photo of our development team um, and they're developing both our for sale for sale product in our um, in our apartments, 
And we've worked really hard to, to balance this team out. You see there's several women. There are two women that aren't even on the slide that, uh, that um, work out of our Boston office. And we have several minorities on, on that team. And it is really very much in balance. And that was really, that took us probably seven years to get to that point, to go from a group of, um, of uh, all white men, and Stephanie Williams was in that group, and then I stole her to work in the management company. So, um, so it's, it's taken us a while to get to this point, but it was very intentional. And you know, I think it's interesting, there's a, there's a really good study that's published every year, McKinsey and LeanIn.org, um, they collaborate on a study about how women and minorities are faring in business. And um, it, it's very interesting, um, and this is a photo of our construction company. We have about 30% of our construction companies female right now. Again, very intentional, looking for female project managers, et cetera. But could you flip to the next one, because I think it's okay. a, a, better, a better slide. Yeah. Kinsey does a study, and, and, and what it said was that 78% of uh, companies reported, um, co company CEOs reported diversity as a, a strategic imperative. Um, so really, really important, something they're very committed to. Um, but yet only 55% of the reports believe that, um, that, they're, that, that diversity is a top priority. So there's an issue with communication in a lot of firms where the CEO really, you know, is really committed to diversity, but it never makes it down to the ranks. And so there's no communication, there's no accountability, and there's no recognition for bringing diversity um, and inclusion into the organization. So I think that that's why we see this one particular slide, um, what's happening um, uh, in our organization. So at the entry level, we're, we're attracting both men and women um, at, at similar rates. But as soon as, um, as, soon as we start promoting, promoting these, pro these, these uh, young execs through the ranks, it really quickly diverges. And so you have to ask yourself, why is that happening? Like, why, why, this, is, this is sort of the unconscious bias that, that I think Lori and, and Ken um, referred to. And I think part of it is an issue of having policies and programs that support diversity. And that's where the inclusion comes in. And so, for instance, just take something very basic like um, family leave. Um, and flexible work schedules, and sort of how how people how people work will really influence um, sort of people in whether they're men or women um, in that manager, VP, senior VP levels because they're typically. Um, those, um, those employees are raising their families when they're going through those particular um, sort of, uh, you know, promotions in their careers. And so they need a little bit of flexibility in order to do that. And so a lot of women, because they, t they tend to bear more of the um, responsibilities at home, will, um, will just sort of drop out because there just aren't policies that are supporting uh, taking them through the pipeline. And so I, I think that, that that's where a lot of issues are in companies. And what we've done at Bazudo is really look at um, our benefits and our programs and how we handle paid leave and how we handle paternity leave and maternity leave to ensure that people can actually manage their lives while they're managing their careers. And I think to the degree that you can do that, you get tremendous amounts of loyalty. And it's not about money anymore. It's really about knowing that you can achieve both your personal and your professional goals uh, within an organization that really understands where you are. And with four generations in the workplace, we have to become very competent at understanding what people's current priorities are and making sure that we have structured our organizations to be able to accommodate whatever needs employees have. And I think that that buys you tremendous engagement and tremendous loyalty. And there's a lot of studies on just the, um, you know, sort of the, the innovation that comes out of engagement and the um, production that comes out of engagement. Because when people are happy, they work, they work harder, they feel more successful. And when, they're unha and when they're miserable at work, all they're thinking about is where they're gonna go next. And you lose out. Right. So I think that we've, we've incorporated all of that, and it's an ongoing thing. I mean, we're really still trying to um, make sure that we're, um, we're learning from our employees on, on, what, on what, what we need to know um, about all the different, um, different constituents that we serve. Right. Ken, I'm going to go off script a little bit just to be fun. Um, you know, you sit on a couple of boards. Uh, one of the key charters of the board is succession, CEO succession. Mm -hmm. 
Uh, what we see going on in the industry quite a bit, uh, because a lot of CEOs kind of rise through the investment development side of the house. Uh, but to Julie's point, you know, um, women may start uh, a development investment career and get to a point, may have children, and then have a very difficult time getting back on that track, you know, uh, without specific mentorship and support from the CEO, um, for sure. Have you, you know, whether it's at, at Well Tower, you know, you're reasonably new at Forest City, but um, have you all addressed that um, uh, in either of those two companies or any, any views on that at all? Uh, I'd say I've seen it handled different ways. Uh, uh, for example, at Forest City, uh, David LaRue has really uh, made, made it a point to try to mentor uh, and develop uh, uh, several people, uh, including several of, uh, of the women at the company. Uh, and I think it's just he regards that as his good management practice. And I know in my own career, look, I, I remember that uh, a lot of you may have heard the name Dick Parsons, who used to be chairman of Time Warner. But Dick used to be head of a savings and loan uh, in New York City, Dime Savings. And when I was an investment banker, he was a client. Then when I came to Fannie Mae, he was a mortgage client. And I was once talking to Dick about my career, and he said, you know, Ken, it's hard moving up the ladder for everybody. It's harder for you because when you get ready to do something, if somebody gives you criticism, you're not sure that they're giving you valid criticism. Are they, are they saying it because you're black, they're being harder on you? He said, there's another element. Yeah. And he says, you have to sort that out. But just realize that every time somebody criticizes you, look at that as an opportunity. And I was fortunate that I had two tremendous bosses, Rob Levin and Larry Small. And uh, I remember how Larry would take me aside Come here. Let me tell you what you said in this presentation today. You know, don't talk like that again. Don't, don't do that. You know, he would just be real blunt. But because I trusted him, what, what, what were I took you doing? his feedback. Yeah. Well, you know, I used to be, uh, I used to be very, uh, I'll put it this way, very politically incorrect, very, uh, ve very loose uh, in but the way that looks I would like do it's things. it's paid off, actually, and, this uh, time around, uh, so. uh, <laughs> and, and Larry, you know, he, he would take me aside and say, you know, you know, be more corporate. You're not selling your soul to do that. So I, I really think the key thing for a company is investing in all your people. But again, if, if, if it's a woman, if it's somebody who's black, somebody Latino, if there's somebody who hasn't been in the mainstream of that company, they may not have the social relationships, they may not be out on the golf course. Uh, so it's really creating a thing where you can give people feedback. And, you know, let's face it, I, I challenge anybody here who's risen up to head an organization who hadn't had their butt kicked at some point in time in their career. Uh, well, a lot of times we let gender and ethnicity get in the way of giving people that feedback. You know, people get scared. I've seen that happen in some companies. Mm -hmm. You know, they don't want to talk to somebody because they're scared uh, uh, or they feel uncomfortable doing it. So if, if, if you have a diverse workforce, having that trust and the ability to give people feedback, that's how you get people through the pipeline because, uh, again, Everybody needs to get that little, get their butt kicked every now and then. And uh, uh, that's how you grow. Now that, again, you see what I mean about not being politically correct? Uh, <laughs> I'm supposed to use some very sophisticated words, but I'm too Texan to do that. So uh, I just talk about getting your butt whipped. But you know, you bring up a really good point because um, uh, you know a lot of conventional wisdom in terms of how we handle performance management today is, you know, is, is the, is, you know, we're, we're really moving away from sort of this annual performance review that's tied to a bonus or salary right. and really having just honest discussions about performance and development on a regular basis. And, and part of that is because you give the opportunity for, yeah. for really effective coaching, but also the, um, you know, the, the millennials that are now no longer 22 are coming into organizations and they're really expecting consistent, very clear feedback on how they can, how they can grow in your organizations. And so even looking at performance management systems um, are really important to how you're managing inclusion and diversity in your companies. Um, Mitch, let, let's assume, you know, a CEO comes into an organization and it's not, um, um, 
literate from a diversity perspective. Mm -hmm. How, how, do you, how do you drive change? You know, how do you effectuate change to make an organization uh, more diverse, more inclusive, um, and, and really drive the kind of culture that's important, would you say? Well, I mean, if you're, if you're coming into a situation that really is lacking that, it, you know, we're in a day and age where the talent pool that we have to choose from is not that deep. Um, and, and so we have to make sure from a, from a CEO's perspective, um, again, I go back to the engagement piece, um, engage uh, not only the industry, but outside of the industry. You know, how we go about recruiting talent to our industry um, is going to be very, uh, very important as, as, uh, as we look and seek to become more diverse as an industry. Um, so some of the things that obviously that I'm, I'm working on and I've mentioned was uh, some of the, the foundation work in, in the state of Georgia. Um, you know, Ten years ago, there was a, a movement uh, by um, some gentlemen in the industry that recognized the need for, for, for talent in our industry, um, both from, a, from a, a diversity standpoint and just from a soft-skilled standpoint. Um, so really, the foundation work that we're doing in the state of Georgia is, is really a holistic approach to uh, promoting our industry uh, from an education standpoint. Um, and, and some of the things that we're doing is, you know, we're at Georgia, University of Georgia, Georgia Tech, teaching classes um, on down through K through 12. We're, we're investing uh, time and money to make sure that a younger generation understands what our, industri what our industry is, what it's about, um, and, and really focus on the potential for someone to make a career in our industry. Um, oh, so th those are some of the things that we're doing from a, from, a, from a foundation standpoint that I think will certainly bear fruit in the coming years. Um, again, casting a wide net from an education standpoint exposes our industry to a lot of different types of folks. Um, and I think that's a powerful thing for us. Mm -hmm. And um, I, I think, again, that's going to bear fruit in the future for us in the state of Georgia. Um, and we're really excited about that. And again, we want to try to match those folks at the end of the day with employers that are, that are wanting to be more diverse. Yeah. Anybody else have any examples of yeah. similar outreach to a yeah. the, diverse uh, uh, generation of talent? The, uh, at the organization I mentioned, Reese, uh, uh, we were having a board meeting one day and several of us have kids uh, who are in college or just out of college and we were all frustrated that a lot of them weren't considering real estate and it led to a discussion and we realized that a lot of people uh, if, if you go look at investment banks uh, everybody wants to go to an investment bank consulting firm or now a technology company and you see that reflected even in the diversity the chairman of American Express is black the head of global investment banking at uh, Citibank, uh, it's a black guy, Ray McGuire, a buddy of mine, uh, you know, because people were attracted. And we looked in real estate, we didn't see that happening. So we got together, uh, Doug, we've spoken with Doug, we've spoken with several of the real estate organizations uh, where we've tried to create a program that identifies uh, minority kids in high school uh, and uh, starts exposing them to real estate because we realize that today, for those of you who have kids in college, most companies start picking their talent the sophomore year in college. Mm -hmm. So if you wait to talk to someone when they're a senior, a lot of the best students have already been picked off. So we said, let's expose people to real estate in high school and let them know about it. So that's one of the things we're doing. And secondly, we actually uh, endowed a scholarship at uh, the Wharton School in honor of one of the uh, founding members of Reese, Alan Braxton. Uh, Again, just as a marking to tell people at Wharton that we knew this is important. This was a guy uh, who helped us. A lot of people get into business. Uh, and we, we've done things like that. And we've also informally tried to uh, reach out to a lot of people. So anytime any of us get an opportunity to address some MBA students or any college students, uh, we always talk about the opportunities in real estate. And uh, it's going to take a lot of work, but uh, I want to throw out one statistic for you. Over 50% of the students at my alma mater, Stanford, are now minorities. 
50%? over 50 percent, 53 percent to be that precise. Un undergrad? That's undergrad. Wow. Uh, Berkeley, I suspect, is a similar thing. Now, that's reflective of the demographics of California. But the point is, if you stop and think about that, and if you start looking at a lot of universities around the country, percentages are rising. So if you're going to get talent, if you go to a place and you're only appealing to one third the student body, you're not going to get the best talent. Yeah, yeah. So we're trying to get the word out so that people will consider, yeah, think about Google, think about Goldman Sachs, but think about joining uh, Camden. Think about joining EQR. Think about maybe joining Railfield one day. There you go. If I, ra if I raise Everybody some more money. Everybody started somewhere. <laughs> <laughs> so that's what we're trying to do. Yeah, okay. and I, I think, uh, you know, internships are a wonderful way to expose yeah. people to our business. And, and like Ken said, you can catch, catch students when they're pretty young. And, uh, you know, making sure that your, the teams that are actually representing you at the universities becomes really important. Um, so we found that to be a great way to bring people into the organization um, as an intern. And then you have a really good shot. You have at least a 50% shot of, of uh, hiring them when they graduate, which is great. We've had people do internships sophomore year, junior, and then ultimately join our company. And they may even join in the management company wanting to be a developer. But at Bazuto, we make it very clear that we're a jungle gym and that you can jump all over the company. You just need to get in, get under the umbrella, and then we'll and then we'll work with you. But I think the other thing that you bring up, which is a really good point with Reese, because I know Stephanie Williams is a member of Reese, and, and, and she's been able to um, leverage her network to be able to bring really strong talent into our organization through the people that she's met through that organization. And I think that to the degree that you, um, you achieve some success at, at having strong, diverse leaders in your organization, then they'll start leveraging their personal networks, which will then continue to bring more diverse candidates into your company and it, it does get easier as you move on so I think that that's really important sort of knowing yeah. you knowing that um, that everyone has a very strong network that's that that could potentially be um, contributing to your organization yeah I would add I just echo that's a it's a fascinating statistic about Stanford and, and you know that's that gives me um, you know hope that diversity sustainability you know if we're going out there and making connections and promoting our industry um, to student bodies that are already diverse. The likelihood of our industry to maintain that level of diversity um, is very encouraging. So that's, that's, a, you know, that's an important part of, of what we're trying to do. Yeah, and Mitch, you know, a great, a great way to really get a look at the students, all, all of the graduate programs are always looking for um, either adjunct professors or just someone to come in and teach a class because it's free to them and um, it's really cost effective. It's a great way for you to meet these students. And we've hired, actually, I was an adjunct at Maryland for years and now I'm just a, I just go in and teach a class every now and then in their um, master's in real estate program. And we've hired several people out of that program, just people that we've met along the way. So it does mean, it doesn't mean you have to do it, but you should just find some people in your company that could, uh, could do that at universities that would be in, nearby. Yeah, and I, and I will add that, um, you know, within Camden, we have made it a point that every, in every city we're located in, we are very much promoting our operations group to partner with the university to start branching out and getting into the business schools and meeting the, the students when they're freshmen and sophomores before they've made decisions about what they think their career path will be. Because many of us here today ended up kind of falling into you know, the multifamily industry. We didn't necessarily think that was the direction we were gonna go, but being exposed to it gives you, you know, some insight in the opportunities, which are vast, throughout this business. Um, so we've done that. We've had the intern programs as well at each of those universities. And then within the Commercial Real Estate Women Crew Group, we have 74 chapters across the US, Canada, and UK, as well as um, a, a tremendous outreach program. We're in these chapters across the country. We have what we call our outreach program. And it's we have the Crew Careers, which is at the high school level. So for instance, in Houston, we have the Barbara Jordan School. It's a great school, inner city school. And each year we take one day that about 50 members from Crew Houston, we go and spend the day with 100 young women that are at the school. And what we do is we break them up into groups of 10. 
and we have our members spend time with each of these groups, giving them a land parcel and say, we want you to figure out what you would develop on this parcel. And we'll have them figure out what they think they need, giving them expertise, you know, giving them some background about, you know, you, you have to pick out the land. You have to make sure it's environmentally safe. You, ha you need an architect. You need a construction person. You know, what are you going to build? And let them kind of create something, and then they present, and then we give awards. And the wonderful thing about it is there have been some young women over the course of the last five to six years that have come out of those high schools realizing that they could maybe even go to college and look at an opportunity to get into this business. And it's wonderful how we've partnered with Dinnerstein. Brian Dinnerstein came and shared one of his sites and what they ended up doing on the piece of land that we had given them. Camden's done the same. But by getting into the high schools, you have at least a chance to attract, like you said earlier, minorities to even consider this as a career path. And then also partnering with all of the colleges um, in the real estate programs to let them know, you know, maybe you don't need to go be a developer day one. Why don't you come and learn the business on the front line? Go work in, you know, at a community for a year or two and then figure out what it is you maybe want to build. So there's, there's different ways to approach it, but I think kind of the grassroots effort of everyone getting involved and, and stepping up to bring awareness to colleges, high schools um, alike will help us kind of change, change the landscape in, in five to 10 years. Well, it, one other point, and you, you meant, made mention, it's, it's one of those things that I, you know, we can't put it in a box. You know, we have to be thinking outside of just a four-year college because not everybody, and then right. speaking from an operator's perspective, you know, the vast majority of folks that are on site, you know, they, they don't have four-year degrees, right? Um, and there's a lot of young people that will not go on to um, pursue a, a four-year degree, right? So. You know, we need to be able to get out in front of folks early at, tech, at the technical college level, the community college level, um, and, and again, you know, something that we're doing in the state of Georgia um, is, is something called the Career Academy Network. So, um, and we're very fortunate to have established a relationship with the Lieutenant Governor's Office as an industry and as a foundation to have a seat at the table at these career academies um, that are, are going on to, um, and again, so. There are multiple different industries that are represented within that career academy, and I'm, I'm excited to say that the apartment industry is one of those. Um, we're sitting at the table um, next to manufacturers and utility companies and, and things of that nature, so I think um, there's a lot of untapped potential um, at, at the high school level and technical college level, too, that we, we don't want to forget as well. Okay. Um, does that mean time out or we're done? We have Two one minute and 40 Come on, Doug, I got a, a minute and That's 47 it. seconds. Yeah. <laughs> okay, just we're, we're going we're gonna to close here just with one comment. Can you put that last slide up on the, on the board again? Who's ever doing the magic slides there for a minute? Um, I just wanted to give everybody a little bit of a takeaway. We do a lot of work with a group called the Center for Talent Innovation, which is the leading diversity consultant across the Fortune 200. So, you know, you, you say to them, in essence, what, what, what can companies do? What can diversity candidates do uh, in order to, to uh, further their career? And there are a couple of key things. Uh, first of all, all the women, all the people of color in the audience, whatever, you know, people are raised through an organization through sponsorship, okay? You're sponsored by the CEO, the CFO, whatever. I would strongly encourage you when you go back to your shop to find somebody who you connect with who can sponsor you. It will make a big, big difference relative to your career. Um, secondly, executive presence, you never underestimate it. You know, as Ken said, there's a double standard, sometimes between men and women, but the bottom line is that gravitas, executive communication, and appearance make a difference. Okay, so never underestimate the importance of executive presence. And finally, any organization that refuses to admit that bias is not, president, is not present is not facing the facts. So the more that organizations can recognize that bias is inherent in any human organization and can try to deal with it, that, that is very, very important from a cultural perspective too. So as you go back to your organizations, those are the types of things that you can materially do to advance your own careers and ultimately um, drive diversity at the top of the organization. So um, I guess we're out of time, Doug. Thank you, everybody. Thank you.